It was fantastic. <laughs> well now, I'm sorry you can't stay for our tall Texan, R.T. Fitch has written a book called Straight from the Horse's Heart, and he also writes this amazing blog of the same title, and he is our next speaker, R.T. Okay, thank you. A real big uh, word of thanks to Equine Advocates uh, and all the volunteers to pull this off. Trust me, we know what it takes to do this. There's a group of people out here called EWA that do an annual conference, and I've seen them struggle for a year. And then we weren't, Ginger, myself, and Stephanie, and Terry weren't here last year because we were doing a press conference, or actually for the summit of the live horse in Oklahoma City to counter Sue Wallace and Dave Duquette. Now, they bailed out. I think the uh, AQHA finally found out what they were funding and bailed, but we didn't bail. We still gave our press conference and put up our billboards. Also, it's kind of out of our modus operandi because somehow Ginger, Simone, and ourselves have fallen into this traveling BLM pain in the ass press conference show where we follow them around the country and on their first day of their wild horse and bureau, uh, burrow bureau, uh, but I'm doing good, I need some more iced tea. <laughs> On the first day of their uh, meeting, we hold a counter press conference. And I'll tell you, it's a lot more fun to be here than it is there for a variety of reasons. Number one, we're not real well liked. And back when Oklahoma, one of our most successful ones, the timing in February was perfect with all this horse slaughter issue going on. And then we had great advocates like uh, Stephanie was there, Barbara was there, I may miss somebody else. But we had over 200 people and it was booked. We had to have five police officers there actually to protect us because we were worried that something may happen that wasn't, wasn't going to be good. And all I could look out when we talked was a sea of tan cowboy hats out there, and man, that's ranchers. If there's a, they wear the same color, they change from felt to straw on the same day, and they're all boxed identical. <laughs> and where it really becomes painful, as you may notice, there aren't a whole lot of male advocates, but I see a lot of guys out there, is I've gotten, as we go to these meetings, my bladder control is much better because the bathroom becomes a real dangerous place for me. <laughs> I have literally walked in there and turned around and everybody and I have on the black hat and they got on the tan and they don't, the only the only the best offense is good defense and hey boys how you doing <laughs> so we want we want to thank you for all that you've done this is important one of the advantages of being towards the end of the program is that just like Tim said earlier that there's a trend here we're speaking to something bigger we're speaking to something um, that is, I don't want to say beyond the horses, but the horses are truly the canary in the mine on many issues. And both the issue of horse slaughter and wild horses, they're now joined at the hip. The only problem I have is the scheduling of where I am. I looked at, this, at the uh, agenda, and I'm right behind Ginger Catherine's, the grand dam of wild horses who's taught Terry and I everything we know about wild horses. And I was going to give a presentation on wild horses. <laughs> so I thought, well, that might not be good, even though we are the Wild Horse Freedom Federation, but we got something. We just got back several months ago from Outer Mongolia, where we did a horseback trek to see the wild tacky the Shavolsky horse, the wild horse of Outer Mongolia. Nobody's ever done that. Ginger has. <laughs> and so has another member of the show. I've never been in a room since I've gotten back that there's at least two. Anybody else here been to Outer Mongolia? <laughs> okay, see, now I can't screw up. Now I'm going to have to pronounce everything right, so I'm going to look at Terry and say, hey, hey, it, how do you say that again? I'm going to say the wrong number of chromosomes or whatever. Yeah. You wouldn't have known before. And then on the other side is these great presenters that we've had and PowerPoint. I mean, look at what John has done in Vickery. And I'm following a, 
a, a cinematographer. She's the last PowerPoint. When we get up here, we're going to show you pictures like we say in Texas, and it's going to like the Clampets go to the slideshow. <laughs> so you're going to have to kind of bear with us here, you know. We do say pictures, don't we, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But that adds to something else for a little bit of clarity. We, Terry and I, are not experts. We're not experts at all. We are dyed in the wool, stick in the throat, Texas taxpayers that got pissed off many years ago. And I say that with passion. When we got back from living in Brazil on an assignment in 19, or no, 2000, we became very involved with horse rescue, and I won't tell war stories, we've all got war stories, but we were pissed off with what we saw as far as abuse. Then it was Jerry Finch of Habitat for Horses who dragged us into the horse slaughter issue. And that's where we met Paula Bacon 10 years ago, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then we, I kind of became pen pals with Ginger and we followed her virtually for the last 16 years now that you've been tracking Cloud, or is it 17? Well, it'll be 18, May 29th. Wow, he's almost old enough to drink. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been following her, and in 2009, we had kind of an epiphany or change there. So this has been an ongoing, ongoing process for us ourselves. But before we get into uh, um, our uh, Fitch slideshow from our summer vacation. <laughs> Just a, a, a comment here on this cover. Um, we were sorry it didn't make it for this uh, particular event, but we were selected, Terry and I, for the annual international equine uh, bonanza or whatever that Horseback Magazine does every year. They do a special on an overseas horse -y type of thing. Last year was trekking through the Sahara, no one the Sahara, it was through South Africa with the lions on horseback. And we feel honored and privileged uh, that Terry's photos were selected and also I wrote the article and that will be out online on May and May 1 and I think the uh, hard copy comes out on the 3rd. Interesting thing, Terry went ahead and sent Steve and Vicki Long some photos she had taken and they selected this photo. This is a young man, 14-year-old um, Mongolian nomad that rode with us and helped us take care of our horses. And this is one of the prize-winning pictures that was selected uh, by the International uh, Equine Photo Contest of which Terry won in the amateur division uh, 11 awards on 10 photos, including uh, People's Choice. So I have to brag on you. <laughs> watching my time, aren't you? No. Oh, okay. Um, just a few updates before we move on. Um, wanted to talk just real briefly uh, on what Wild Horse Freedom Federation is doing as far as investigations of the BLM and what they do with our horses and, and uh, long-term holding. Uh, at the, our last press conference in uh, Oklahoma City, we came out publicly with the documentation that we do have evidence that um, a BLM long-term holding contractor is selling, has sold uh, your wild horses that he's paid to take good care of to kill buyers. Now we took that information, we put it in a packet, the next day I gave it to all of the members of the board. Um, the only one who showed interest was Tim Harvey and, and uh, Joan Goyfield who is the uh, new manager of the BLM Wild Horse Program, Bot had a fit. If I could go, <laughs> that's about what she did through the whole meeting. Anytime we came up with any hardcore evidence, she wanted nothing to do, do with it. But we're pursuing that. Um, it could lead to legal litigation, so we won't talk about that much more. But that's our passion. It takes a great deal of time and a great deal of money uh, to, to uh, pull those sort of investigations off. Also, you may have seen in what we've written that Equine Welfare Alliance and Wild Horse Freedom Federation have partnered with investigations. We have litigation, but you can't have good litigation without good evidence. And also, many times, just getting that evidence in the hands of the right people in the right press, as Vickery's been saying, is enough 
to lead to some dramatic uh, uh, things being un uncovered that could lead to serious investigations, I hope one day, like a congressional one. Uh, we did not create, we have brought on board two professional certified investigators. We did not do this uh, in any means or fashion to discredit any other investigative group. It's just that between horse slaughter and the wild horse issue, uh, we wanted to be able to direct these investigations. Um, so if I could, Terry and I are going, I think I've got the steering wheel and you've got, oh, I don't have squat. <laughs> Thank you. And I think she's going to have the gas pedal. But um, we, a couple of, well, actually in, in February, got to stay in front of the camera. Thank you. You can holler at me, I'm used to it. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, our organizations uh, got back a FOIA on the issue of horse meat being shipped through the uh, port of Houston. Now, it's illegal to ship any horse meat through Texas. And, and we were shocked at what happened. But we managed a little different because whether Vickery realizes it or not, I'm listening to her. So we put it out on the blog, and I, and I said, that's not good enough. I got on the phone that day, much to Terry's chagrin, and I called up every single news station in Houston, Texas, and I sent them emails to every single thing. I must have spent six hours just in the emails. And we finally get out to go grocery shopping, and the phone rings, and it's NBC. And they want to talk, and they want to talk now. And they want an exclusive because they're not happy with just shooting a story at 3 o'clock. Like we've had people out to our farm or ranch at 3 o'clock, and it's on the 6 o'clock news. He said, I want exclusive because I want to spend some time looking into this. Mm -hmm. So you've got to give me till tomorrow night. And I thought, hey, should I really do that? <laughs> Terry, says, Terry says, remember what you say about first transportation? It works for the press too. Nab it. So if we could hit the lights. Um, we have a little bit of a video problem. It's not perfect. But this is the show that they aired, and remember, all this information came from our FOIA. Oh, am I supposed to do something here? I thought you wanted to do something. Okay, I did something. Now you get to do something. And turn the volume all the way up, if you don't mind. Come on, volume. Neil's label is beef in 13 countries in Europe, but that horse meat trade is not limited to overseas. Local to investigate found a Texas company shipping it right through the port of Houston. Local 2 investigator Joel Eisenbaum is joining us live at the board with more on what he's uncovered here. Joel? You know, bill records we examined show more than a million pounds of horse meat has moved through the port of Houston just since last August. A Texas company is shipping this stuff, and another company that feeds people is buying it. Local 2 investigates has learned ships traveling in and out of the port of Houston are carrying horse meat. A lot of it shipped by a Texas company, and there are questions now whether it's legal. Somebody may have an interest in looking into it in further detail. Documents we obtained show those shipments include fresh chilled horse meat, frozen boneless horse meat, trimmings, forequarters, hindquarters, hundreds of thousands of pounds of slaughtered horse meat headed from Mexico, stopping in the port of Houston, and eventually making its way by giant ships like these to Russia and the Netherlands. As further horse meat contamination is uncovered, there are fears that horse meat could be at frozen supplies stocked in schools and hospitals. Horse meat for human consumption has been in the news lately overseas, as beef products across Europe are showing up with unreal wanted horse meat in them and there have been a lot of questions about where that horse meat is coming from to have it land right back in our laps here in houston uh we found very very shocking rt fitch is president of the wild horse freedom federation he thinks kaufman texas based international unicorn could be breaking the law if humans are eating that horse meat and an attorney who examined that texas law for us says there's a good case for that but i believe the statute is written broad enough that somebody could be prosecuted under it. Local 2 Investigates has learned the president of the Texas company shipping all that horse meat is also the founder of the Dutch meat company receiving all that horse meat. And on that Dutch meat company's website, they proudly proclaimed, quote, 
Horse meat is one of the healthiest kinds of meat for human consumption. Tried to call International Unicorn in Texas for comment. Nobody answered the phone. Called the Port of Houston for comment. They referred us to Customs. Customs referred us to the USDA. USDA has not returned our phone calls yet. We're live in Southeast Houston tonight. I'm Joe Weisenbaum, KPRC Local 2. Thank you, Joel. Joel also says that Kaufman, Texas, where that horse meat shipping company is based, has an interesting story. Until 2007, Joel says, it was home of one of the biggest horse slaughter plants in the nation. Now we'll hold it right there, and I don't know why that picture's up there. <laughs> it's bad editing on my part. I'm just glad that the video played. But that shows you, by contacting people and doing what Vickery says, that you, with that information in hand, can make a difference. Bravo. Now, he found out more than we found out. We just showed him the FOIA and the info. He made the phone calls, whatever. But I'm here to tell you that the investigative force of EWA and Wild Horse Freedom Federation, we were on it. And this is how we're on it. You might check, you might feel that, or see that Terry and I look a little tired. Well, we've been undercover for the last 10 days, driving through auctions and stalking kill buyers in North Texas and also in South Oklahoma. And And one of our first stops is we fired up our two investigators and Terry and I got in Big Red the Dooley station to find the corporate headquarters of International Unicorn. This, these people who are shipping a million pounds and months of horse meat to the Netherlands. We thought you folks would be interested in seeing this exclusive, never before seen picture of the corporate headquarters. There you go. <laughs> there it is. 1118 Crestview in Kaufman, Texas. So, what's that tell you? Long term consequences. Yep. Everything associated with horse slaughter is a lie, it's a front. This is nonsense. But I, I was ready to get out of the truck and I was going to go up and. <laughs> I'm R.T. Fitch from Straight From the Horse's Heart. I want to talk to you about your business. There were four women in that cab with me that said no. So I got a hold of Joe um, Eisenbaum, the reporter, and I said, Hey, I found the place. I want to go to an interview. He said, Not good, R.T. <laughs> Which brings me to another story. Two investigators, and I did, know that, did not know on God's green earth it was possible for ten conversations to go on with only four <laughs> miles. <laughs> and I'm not a chauvinist by any stretch of the imagination, and I will probably pay for this later. <laughs> but there are parts of my anatomy that still hurt from being so puckered when I was driving, because I'll give you a little example. Day one, we, had, we did a lot of filming and chasing. Let's go by so-and-so's house. Okay, stop, no, slow, no, turn right, pull off on the side of the road, no. There he okay. is. There he is. Oh, the worst one is, they didn't let me eat lunch. <laughs> and I was, I was eyeballing, it was about 10 o'clock at night, and we were on, on, an, on an expressway, and we, were, we got off to go to this Mexican restaurant, and I could smell the Shinerbach beer there waiting for me. And I go to go through it, no, no, there's a truck over there, oh God, no, no. And I, it's a red light, so I miss it. I get off, they said, pull over there. I said, well, no, I pulled off on the exit ramp. I can't go back, back up. Well, go down there and then turn around and come back. Well, how far is the next? It's about 12 miles. It's not too bad. You know, I'm coming around. And then we come back and we can't find it. Well, he's got to go that way, RT. Speed up. Hurry up. <laughs> Meanwhile, Terry's in. Get a ticket and you're a dead man. <laughs> and this went, this went on for days. And I'm, the last time was after we took that picture. And I'm coming into intersection and I'm saying, directions, ladies, directions. Which way, which way? And I get a. I don't know how I got a reverse out of it, but go straight, turn left, turn right, go back. Right, no left, 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 no right. <laughs> this, this, this played with my head so bad. The next day, Terry and I were riding alone and we were following our, our we're going back up, we're going up into Oklahoma, and I was following our investigators in their car. I went about an hour and I said, dang. I haven't said a word, and I don't know what to say. It's been beat out of me. So it was an interesting experience, that part. The rest of it was not so interesting. Um, 
while in Kaufman, honey, I lost control of the steering wheel. <laughs> okay, there we go. This is uh, Paula and a mystery photographer uh, in front of the Dallas Crown Kaufman plant. We are working on a uh, television project. I can't say too much about it right now, but we are working. And uh, Paula, pretty much you've seen her today, stood there and talked about the plant. Um, I had been up, the last time I was up there at the plant was about eight Finch in a hotel room, and we planned how we were going to go do some uh, observing. And all I know, John, you've been there too. And I hated this conversation because it hurt me. And as you saw today, she is I remember going back uh, with Robert Eldridge on his property back behind the slaughterhouse and climbed the tree that they had polished the bark on to look over the fence because the kill box is just on the other side. Mm. And Jerry Finch grabbed me by the shoulders. He said, you really want to do this? He said, it will change your life. Mm -hmm. You will not be the same man. And I said, yeah, I got to see it. I mean, hell, I could smell it six blocks away. I could hear it going on over there. I said, I want to see it. It's an experience that uh, is not fun. The only good thing I can say is the cheap horses weren't being bought. Is there a dog here? <laughs> oh. Sorry. Okay. Uh, but it wears you out. Um, the last one, we were in Oklahoma, which we really won't confess to where we were, because Terry and I do not want to blow our cover nor give away our disguise. We blend in. I dress down very well. Um, I, watching 70 horses go through there and donkeys, and um, they were not abused, but just what they were. It, it, it reminded me akin to, well, I heard the word slavery before, a slave auction. They're worth so much a pound. They're nothing. They're properties. They're not, they don't have feelings. And I saw feelings before that last auction, and it ripped my heart out. We couldn't stay through the auction because of it. Terry and I went to where they were weighing the horses. The only good thing that happened there was the vet got stepped on because he's such an idiot. He wore tennis shoes, and he got his foot stepped on. I tried not to cheer because that would have blown my cover. But um, um, the horses were being pulled out, and this particular gray gelding was pulled out, and his halter was taken off. He was kept in the run. And his owner turned around to take the other two out. And that gelding walked and looked and saw and came back and nudged his owner. And he ignored him and he took the other two halters off and he laid his head on him. And he nudged him in the cheek. And then the guy came with the, uh, the auction guy came and cracked the, the, the whip. And he went halfway down the run and he turned and stopped and looked back. And even as he got him going, he looked one more time, and John said it, and I'll say it, it's all about betrayal, absolute betrayal. That horse didn't have any idea and was afraid. So enough of that, enough of that. Oh. We will move on to our presentation. The Fitches go to Outer Mongolia. And, and why would we do that? A couple from Texas. We actually discussed this with Ginger Catherine's uh, quite a while before we went. Because to Terry and myself, to have an emergency democratic young country uh, striving to reintroduce their native wild horses while we, this great American land here, is destroying our wild horses. It was a paradox that we wanted to see exactly what they were doing. And so Terry and I spent about a, um, I didn't say click. You told me to just go through them. No, not yet, because there's certain ones I want to talk about. I know you're going to click through all the ones that have pictures of you. You're right. Okay. <laughs> but um, there's. We'll, we'll tell you more, but we actually landed on the day of the Nadam Festival, which is a kind of like their Mardi Gras. Um, Outer Mongolia is a sandwich between uh, Russia and China. They're a democratic country. Eighty percent of the people are nomads. And they make their, their living all from goat, sheep, horses, and yak. They have no vegetables, as our guide would say. Yeah, he wanted to know if I was a vegan. He should be here now, because I know there's lots of vegans here. 
go ahead. You can go ahead and go through these, Terry. But this was our first day. Everything is centered around the horse. The horses outnumber, if I use Dave, Dave Duquette's number, um, there's 3,500 horses per person in Mongolia. In reality, there's about 100. I and mean, they're really outnumbered. That's Terry. Okay. Everything, their entire culture is centered around the horse. And these horses, look how small they are. They um, are the same descendants of the horses that carried Shingis Han all the way into Europe. And they're stout enough that they could carry a man that far, plus his armor and the armor for the horse. Keep going, babe. You're good. And the next day is the ra uh, we're the races. Um, Ginger knows about the races. They're a lot more humane, I think, than when you were there. Only young children. What's the oldest child, Terry? Nine? I think it was nine. Nine years old. Kids race these horses 25 kilometers, and they do have ambulances that ride with them, but the event attracts half a million people. Uh, on, on the race route, so it's pretty interesting. You can keep going and you see a lot of, again, everybody shows up at the race on their horse. All the things in the background are kites, believe it or not, in the sky. Even, I'll tell you what, I saw some things done on horseback with the army that I've never seen done before. They even have the horses trained to run up quick, skid on their side, lay down so that they can be hidden from the enemy behind the horse. Okay, babe. That's okay, he's a doctor. We excuse him. Okay. Yes, and they have high stepping cowboys there, too. And the race. Which was actually very, very interesting. As far as you could see, for 25 kilometers, people had their gears set up and uh, cars. I mean, all of Mongolia shows up for the races. And see, they're all kids, bareback, running their hearts out. And the horses, we checked the horses, they really were not in that bad of shape. Now, how they train these horses, there's no such, you can keep going, no such thing as a, oh, well, you can stop there, a, a domesticated horse in Mongolia. They let the stallion out, they actually act, the bands of horses, actually act like wild horses. The stallion, we'll show some pictures here in a little bit, the stallion himself, is always allowed to be free and they come once a year and they'll take off younger younger mares and they'll shear the other mares manes because they make things out of their mane but how do you how do you pronounce that ginger so i don't screw up what Hustai. Hustai. it was who stand in when i was there so maybe they just abbreviated it okay they didn't have a fancy gate like that either well i took a lot of pictures here to see if you if there's okay. been any change but this is a national park in mongolia where they're introducing, reintroducing the Shabalski horse, or we don't like to refer to him because he was the explorer, the Taki. You can keep going. This ginger was for you. It says here in the National Park, uh, below activities are extremely prohibited, more so than those are just kind of prohibited. So, <laughs> next. Uh -huh. This is, we was there. And when you're there, you stay in these little accommodations. With no running water, that brings back some memories, doesn't oh, it? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh wow! See the same, the same. There was only one then, you know. A one? Okay. We actually had bathrooms. There's two things that you miss in Mongolia. One thing is there's no bathrooms, and there's definitely no hot water. I got to the point of wishing for hot water more than beer, and that's bad. Now this, for this part of our trip, and trying to get to the horses, I mean the um, tacky. We hired a, uh, a, a car, a driver on the right, who was so proud to have that American shirt on, and a guide. And you can keep moving. Our first day, uh, we tried to find the horses. These guys were pretty good at finding them. And on the way to the, on the, way to the uh, mountain range, we stopped it there. This is a country steeped in history. But we ran into a little bit of a problem in looking for the horses. We'd come up on a ridge, and with Terry's telephoto, we'd see a horse way away and in a car that had no business being an offshore I mean an off-road vehicle we try to get to the next ridge maybe get another shot but this is what we got most of in the next picture butts and dust 
<laughs> and see, Ginger talked about the book, Wild Horses for Dummies. Terry did the forward for her on that. <laughs> <laughs> and has been personally trained because as the three... Oh. Where are you going? I think you need to go back. See? I'm, I'm driving. You're driving too fast. Go back. Okay, so freeze. Stop. Um, because as we guys kept climbing and hiking and climbing and hiking, I got a video camera with me, and uh, the other guys are carrying their heavy iPhones, and we're getting worn out. Terry stood back. She was down in the valley. We came down. I said, well, we saw one, and you didn't have your big cameras. And she just looked at the guy and said, where's the water? I said, well, what do you mean? She said, as Ginger says, if you can find the water, they will come. <laughs> so we found the water. Terry was right. Can you make that go? Oh. You might want to turn this down. Oh. No. That one is a video. Oh, is that the video? We didn't rehearse well, long. No wonder it's blurry. <laughs> this is amateur, by the way, not produced by Ginger Catherine. <laughs> Two extra chromosomes, right, Ginger? Mm -hmm. They're the true primitive wild horse. That's something right, right there, right out of prehistoric times. And they're absolutely beautiful. But I must say that when we found this watering hole, it was like the rocks in the mountains above us began to move and one band after another came down, and this was the first one down. Uh, I hate to say it, Terry was right. She listened well with Ginger. Can you turn that down just a bit? I, I just want to show you this segment, then we'll move on. This is my wife stalking wild horses. But what I, I really want to show you here is there's no helicopters. There's nobody from the BLM telling us to get back. There's no harassment. It was pristine. And from what we've been through over the years, outside of the priors, but we've had our bad days in the priors too, this was food to the soul. And right about here, I started shouting at Terry, don't get any closer. Okay. But what's important, <laughs> but what's important about this is I sat down with my video camera and taking all these shaken pictures and I don't know how long we sat there we were the only people we're way back would it take us three four hours to get back there there's no one around at all and we're taping this and we're watching it and in a matter of just a few minutes it seemed like I don't know the time passed that way I was surrounded we were surrounded by people speaking a different language people dressed differently in strange vehicles there must have been 50 to 60 people when I panned back, and I, I, I was so shocked I turned the camera off. All around us, in fact, you could have just there real briefly, you could see somebody standing. They weren't there. You can ace that puppy. And the reason that's important, it was my first epiphany of the trip. And that is the power of the wild horse, the majesty the healing, the cleansing, of seeing them in their native habitat transcends all cultures, transcends all language barriers, and all geography. And that's what I took away from that moment and our visit with the tacky. You can, you can move on. So back, back to the um, gear camp we went, and then we proceeded um, for our horse trek. And this is an alleged band of domestic horses. But we contracted a, uh, how am I doing on time? Okay, we contracted, you can hold there, a van, a four-wheel van, and we roughed it. We had a driver and a cook. And our, and our guide, go ahead, next one. And that's what our van looked like. Because that was a 10 days worth of, worth of food and tents and everything else. Let's go.
And again, we stayed at another camp while we negotiated with the local tribesmen for horses. And this is why you haven't seen any pictures of Mongolia. This would be considered animal abuse here. <laughs> to put my fat butt up on top of one of those horses, and we were arguing about the saddle, because the Mongolian saddles are made out of wood, both front and back. And they're just littler than me. So this is a Russian saddle. But um, here we are um, readying ourselves for our trek. And what happens is we just rode like that, and the van would go in advance and set up for lunch and set us up for dinner. But I want to show one more thing. Stop here. We were two hours in, into the mission when we crested on top of a mountain, and these are like altars, temples, where they, from being Muslim or Buddhist, they walk around and throw stones, and there's a horse head there. And Terry said, don't look. I said, I'm going to take a picture of you and try not to. Those are our horses and our vehicle, support vehicle behind us. Go to the next one, will you? It's a horse head, a fresh horse head. And our guide saw that we were looking at it. We were trying not to be conspicuous because we didn't know the meaning. And this is one of the reasons we wanted to live and eat with them because a lot of things get misconstrued culturally because that is highly offensive. I could never do that to any of my horses. But the story behind that was is that one of the tribesmen had just lost his favorite horse. And he had placed his head upon this stone altar so that the horse could, the spirit of that fine horse would be reincarnated into one of his current horses. And then they prayed and, and so what looks horrible to them isn't all that bad. So you can take it away from here. You, you can drive. I want to give you the gas pedal and the steering and everything. <laughs> but that's, that's uh, basically what lunch would look like. Um, as we traveled the days with our, um, our guide, and we also had two 14-year-old boys with us from the, from the tribe. One was the son of the guy who uh, leased us the horses to make sure we didn't bother the horses. And he said his 14-year-old nephew, too. And they knew no English, and they thought we were, they were scared of us at first, but we had a good time with them. And as we traveled and spent night, uh, nights together, and um, unlike um, Victoria, who travels around the world and meets with high-ranked officials, uh, we were sitting um, uh, roasting marshmallows over uh, yak poop. <laughs> but we were talking about heavy things, and a couple of the questions I wanted to ask was if the horse is in the middle of your culture, why do you eat them? Because they do. Why do you slaughter your horses and eat them? And through our, our guide and our interpreter, the answers that were coming back were, number one, well, we only eat the mares. And that's true. They only eat the mares. They don't touch the stallions. Um, they also uh, milk the uh, mares uh, and make fermented uh, mares milk, which is the prime drink mm -hmm. in Outer Mongolia. And I drank it by accident. Didn't even know I drank it because I was in a gear trying to do the culturally right thing. And they dipped this stuff on the white bowl and handed it. The master handed it to me. And I said, drink, drink, you got to drink. And he said, whispered, 17% alcohol. And I went, Rrr. that was good. And I handed it to Terry. And she said, do you know what you just drank? I said, well, what? Mare's milk. I got food poisoning from that. It was not pretty. Um, and the other answer to this horse slaughter question was, we only do it in the winter. And I, I said, that's not good enough. I want to know, why do you kill and eat your god? And it got boiled down to, I get this perplexed look. They said, no one's ever asked us that before. It's because we always have. It's because it's part of us. And I see a parallel there, not with our political leaders or the, the gangsters who push horse slaughter, but I see a lot of that perhaps in some of their followers, who that is the way horses were always livestock. That's how Grandpa used to do it. That's how Dad did it. And they're of limited um, scope. And I, I saw somewhat not being degrading, but a little bit of a parallel there, and that was epiphany number two. And thirdly, we rode for weeks and weeks, not weeks, I mean days and days, 
about a week and a half. It seemed like weeks because I'd have to write this way because I had to decide if I was going to destroy my backside or if I was going to destroy my front side so I would rotate <laughs> and kind of spread the pain. I referred to that saddle as a pelvic destroyer. <laughs> the third epiphany was just on the last day we could see the gear camp on the horizon. By the way, all these things in the background, those are all sheep and horses and that's how that's our tent and that's their tent and we camped amongst them at night and my six foot two frame didn't fit in this little Mongol tent so there's this bulge in my head and I can't I don't know if it was dogs, horses, or whatever would snip it about three o'clock every morning and wake me up. <laughs> But as I knew this life experience was ending, my horse carrying my frame was always in back. I actually trotted up to Terry and said, you know, in all this time, what I haven't seen, I haven't seen at all what's missing from this. She said, what? I said, a fence. There are no fences. We ride through herds. We see the nomads. We, everybody, there's no fences anywhere. And so we called over our guide and said, what's the deal? Why? Are there no fences? He said, because this is public land. Everybody in Mongolia owns this land. If we all own the land, why would you put fence up? Don't you have public land? <laughs> Epiphany number three. So, as Terry goes through those houses, yes, we actually watched an entire season of Dallas on that computer while we were traveling. But on a serious note, <clears throat> just let me close out uh, in reading a paragraph out of the article that I wrote for Horseback Magazine. Yeah, that's a little munchkin there. Yeah, it's you. But, definition, Outer Mongolia fighting to do the right thing for their native horses and environment, but held hostage by tribal customs and cultural norms while considering their public lands to be a free use for both citizens and four-legged inhabitants. Are parallels to be drawn and lessons to be learned by the United States from this small emerging democracy? I think so, and we don't have much time left to debate the issues, for our wild horses and burros are almost gone. We do not want horse slaughter brought back to this country, and public land should not be squandered and spoiled by special interests. I am thankful for the insights granted to me by my Mongolian hosts, but I walk away with the bittersweet thought that perhaps we are not the best example for this new-born democracy, but instead, perhaps we should look back at our humble beginnings and learn to correctly walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. Thank you.